Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by the International Science Research Journals. International Science Research Journals, ISRJ, is an online publisher of the world's highest impact, most cutting-edge research. As a leader in open access, OA, ISRJ caters to only the most interdisciplinary, highest impact research. While keeping our highest editorial standards, we have the fastest peer review, with a guarantee of a maximum turnaround time of 24 hours. We have a lower acceptance rate on the first submission than Nature or Science, although upon second submission, there is almost a 100% acceptance rate. For only the low rate of $400 to submit, $100 for each figure, $50 for each appendix, $25 for each author, and $10 for each affiliation, you can submit a manuscript. Also note, for each citation that you give the journal, you'll receive a $5 discount on your submission fee, which reminds us that our impact factor is 46.4. What can art reveal about the human brain? Can it be used to study pleasure or reward processes? Or how the brain assigns value? Or can it be used to study either episodic or procedural memory? Or even the processes and pathways of perception? Art can, and in the context of neuroscience, do all of these things and many more, including studying emotions and emotional pro- experiences. Neuroaesthetics is an emerging field where scientists use the tools of neuroscience to study art and art processes. Today I speak with Sherland Edouard about perception and art. So thank you so much for coming in. I'm with uh, Sherlan Edouard, and we're talking about lots of things, art, creativity, uh, and most importantly, the brain. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, start with asking you, well, what got you interested in, in art and, and being creative? Um, I would say my love for color and design. Mm-hmm. Um, I love variety of color and mixes of color and just um, like expressing something out of it. And so I just wanted to understand like what the brain had to do with that and how it helped to facilitate um, the type of creativity that we see in our everyday lives. Yeah, what's, what sort of creativity are you appreciating in, in your life? Um, I really love fashion design. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so are, would you consider yourself a fashionista? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, get, I think I like more of the aspect of like, designing than the aspect of being the model. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so what uh, sort of people do you look to as like uh, great designers? Um, I actually don't have people, like specific people that I look for. Mm-hmm. I think I care more about like the design and something like looking nice, like in my own perspective, than actually like, oh, like the person themselves, like the creator yeah Yeah. okay (laughs) Uh, so more appreciating what they're making than who they are and what they're making Uh, how about for uh, in terms of color what sorts of colors are you kind of um, attracted to or what uh, in your mind is something interesting I really like jovial and bright colors Mm -hmm. Um, but like I feel like my favorite color right now is cranberry red cranberry red Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, yeah I asked uh Claudia, she was talking about uh, color perception uh, in her podcast, and I wanted to, uh, or I asked her what her favorite color was. I think it was blue, maybe, because I, I also said that my favorite color was blue. Uh, though growing up, my favorite colors were red and black, uh, because I was a Chicago Bulls fan. <laughs> uh, and so, in your research, uh, in terms of the brain, uh, what have been some of the, some of the most interesting findings so far? Um, something that I found to be really interesting is like the decoding of different emotional facial expressions such as, you know, like, expressing joy or surprise or anger or sadness and how um, it is important for artists to be able to do this, like, to decode different facial expressions so that they can actually replicate these features um, in their drawings of, like, their object of focus, in this case, of humans, um, so that they can display, like, the correct tone of the situation Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and also, are there colors that kind of map onto different emotions? Um, I think there are, but I'm not sure the specific 
Matthews. Yeah, because I'm just thinking, like, uh, oh, I'm feeling blue today. Uh, yeah. Like, I th- think most people uh, recognize that as, like, I'm feeling down or depressed. Uh, but I don't, I can't think of too many others, like, I'm feeling mm-hmm. yellow today. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what that would mean. I guess I would, that makes me... Maybe makes, for me, like, yellow is, like, sunshine, you know, like, joy, uh-huh. happy. I was going the other way and thinking yellow is like jaundiced and like someone's sick. <laughs> <laughs> so we have different conceptions of, mm-hmm. of colors. Uh, how about uh, some other uh, research from uh, the brain and, uh, and creativity? Um, Do you have any other um, interesting uh, studies that, that you found? Um, no, not really. I think that was what really um, captured my attention, the facial expressions one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and do you think that there's any aspects of art and creativity that's kind of confusing uh, once you start looking at the research? Um, I think it's more like it's the neuroscience part is what's a little bit more confusing because like there are so many like different processes that are involved Mm -hmm. um, in the facilitation of visual perception and in order to understand that you have to first understand like what these processes are like where they are in the brain Mm -hmm. how they're connected to one another and how they work um, to facilitate like visual perception, yeah. So I guess like for someone who doesn't really have a background in psychology or neuroscience, it it can take some time um, to understand that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I wrote uh, my qualifying exams. One of my qualifying exams was on visual perception, and so it was like seven or eight pages of just like the intricate details of um, light coming into the eye, going into the brain, and being. Uh, recognized as things we see Uh, so I can definitely understand how uh, then trying to apply that in terms of creativity would be really confusing yeah Uh, and you produced a a really interesting video uh, that we've uploaded to uh, YouTube Um, what has been the uh, kind of response of uh, people that have seen it well there are no comments no comments yeah (laughs) okay see Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, I think there was, what, more than 30 or 40 views so yeah, far? Yeah, there were 30 views so far. Yeah, and I, I liked it. I don't, I don't remember if anyone else had had mm-hmm. liked it yet. Um, have, has any of your uh, friends or family uh, watched it and contacted you? Oh, I haven't really told them about it. Oh, <laughs> you have to put it on, on Facebook or yeah. uh, any other social media and let them, let them see. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> so it, it hasn't been public yet. You, uh, we have to uh, get you to put it out on, on your, any social media and, and invite your family and friends to watch it uh, so that you can get some more um, feedback. Uh, so I'm happy that uh, without you advertising it to people that it's <laughs> already at 40 views. So yeah. that's interesting. Uh, and I, one of my friends, I know, uh, I had tweeted it. I think he uh, he liked it. He, he's interested in, well, he's a neuroscientist up in uh, Canada, and he uh, liked it. He, he's, I think he plays the guitar, so uh, he's interested in kind of creativity uh, on the musical side instead of the, uh, like, drawing side. Uh, and how about going forward? Do you think that there's any newer developing areas of research? Um, I was looking through, and one developing area of research that I found it's like the study of visual motion perception, so it's kind of like more specific, and there and this is more like I guess 2013. I'm not sure like right now, but they were coming, starting to understand that the right ventral visual pathway is at, as important as the dorsal visual pathway for visual motion perception, um, and it just showed like how more how much more connected um, the ventral um, visual like cortex is when it comes to visual processing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, vision has been kind of the prime example of two, the dual stream uh, idea of how information kind of gets separated into specific components. So you have your dorsal like motion stream or where stream, and then your ventral like what stream, uh, and uh, they've kind of been thought to be very separate things. But th- this research seems to be saying that maybe they're not as separate as we thought once thought. Yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, so maybe as we get close to wrapping up here, is there any one really important thing that you want to talk about in terms of uh, your research on, on visual perception? I think like one important thing that needs clarification is that processing facial features is not the same thing as processing emotional facial expressions. Um, there are different processes involved. And we can even see that, like in children with Down syndrome, like they are able to like process facial features, but they are not as able to process emotional facial expressions, showing that you know they have some 
um, like in their brain, there's like some abnormalities in the in the networks that are um, that are important for <laughs> processing uh-huh. yeah. emotional facial expressions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little more confusing than uh, we thought. It's kind of like the uh, sum is greater than the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, all right. So l- wrapping up, I, I think you had uh, one thing to uh, advertise or, or promote. Right. So um, in about one week, April sixteenth, on Saturday at eight thirty, Christian House has a game night. So we would like for anyone, everyone to come. <laughs> yeah. And do you um, which yeah. house on campus? It is in a, at apartment fourteen, first floor. Okay. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talking about creativity, visual perception, and the brain. So thanks so much to Shalan for coming in and speaking about art and perception. A uh, really interesting discussion and something that, uh, as I said, is an emerging field uh, in neuroscience. Uh, my, my friends uh, just took a postdoc in uh, neuroaesthetics uh, in New York, so uh, quite a, a new and developing field. Uh, and uh, as I introduced at the beginning of the show, uh, something that touches on a lot of different things in neuroscience. You can look at uh, what sort of things are brought up to mind or brought to memory by looking at different uh, artwork or pieces of art, uh, or you can look at uh, expertise and see how people uh, develop an expertise in different artistic skills uh, over time. You can look and see how uh, art therapy might uh, be helpful for staving off Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, maybe it's also helpful for uh, individuals uh, with other psychiatric illnesses. Uh, so it's quite a uh, new and interesting uh, field uh, that uh, neuroscience is starting to shed light on. Uh, turning to the last two uh, bits of the show, uh, I'll turn to Jake's Jams. This is the part of the show where I talk about something that I like, uh, something that uh, I've come across and want to share with everyone. Uh, I <clears throat> just got back from the 2016 Cognitive Neuroscience Society meeting up in New York City, uh, Midtown Manhattan, and uh, to get there uh, for the first time, I took the train. Uh, I took Amtrak Rail uh, from Philadelphia, actually uh, the second closest station uh, to the apartment that I'm uh, staying in. Uh, and took it right to Penn Station, which, uh, surprisingly to me, uh, was right underneath Madison Square Garden. Uh, I think I had a 1940s view of, uh, Penn, of Penn Station and kind of thought it was this grand, uh, huge, uh, above-ground uh, train station. Uh, I didn't realize that it was uh, underneath or underground uh, for all of the uh, stations and stops, so I was quite surprised <laughs> getting off the train uh, in New York just a few days ago uh, to find that... I was underground and uh, didn't really know where I was, uh, but Amtrak uh, was great. To, it was on time, going both directions, uh, didn't have any problems. Only took uh, about two hours to get from um, Philadelphia to uh, New York, uh, and it was quite easy, quite simple. Uh, so I definitely enjoyed Amtrak uh, and wish I, I could take uh, the train to other places. Uh, I've now uh, gone to conferences, obviously by airplane. Uh, by boat uh, out in San Diego at, I believe, another Cognitive Neuroscience, but maybe it was SFN, Society for uh, Neuroscience meeting. Uh, We stayed on Coronado Island and would take the boat, uh, commuter boat, from Coronado over to mainland San Diego every day, Uh, and now uh, trains, so planes, trains, and automobiles, uh, as well as boats. uh, I've uh, arrived to conferences in, but I uh, enjoyed Amtrak and and would definitely uh, take it again. Uh, and uh, turning to uh, another segment of the show, uh, Scholar Notifications. A uh, really interesting uh, Scholar uh, update uh, that I received uh, in my uh, Google Scholar Notifications a few weeks ago uh, came from uh, collaborators of mine, uh, Signe Sheldon and Brian Levine. Signe Sheldon's, uh, uh, I guess, going on a year now. Uh, she's been a uh, PI uh, up at McGill in Montreal. And my uh, R, uh, Signe's, and my postdoc advisor, Brian Levine, uh, at the Rotman Research Institute in Toronto. Uh, they released a review article uh, in the annals of New York Academy of Sciences uh, called The Role of the Hippocampus in Memory and in Mental Construction. And it was a great article uh, that uh, gives um, kind of the most up-to-date uh, understanding of what the hippocampus is doing in terms of um, memory and mental construction. It's something that uh, is immediately going to enter... Uh, my uh, fundamental reading for students uh, interested in, in working with me on memory, uh, and definitely something that will probably find its way into uh, any 
seminar that I teach on memory and uh, probably even a cognitive neuroscience course uh, when we look at memory and uh, its contribution to uh, episodic memory and autobiographical memory. Uh, so uh, the role of the hippocampus in mental uh, memory and mental construction uh, by Sheldon and Levine uh, in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences 2016, uh, a great uh, review article uh, with lots of uh, amazing information uh, and something that I certainly recommend. Uh, so uh, turning to the last uh, segment of the show that's still not a segment uh, since there's no one uh, emailing me, uh, but at, well, newest uh, update uh, in this uh, forum of the show is that I have a new email uh, instead of my uh, last name at gmail.com. Uh, you can contact me at uh, engagebrainpodcast at gmail.com uh, if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, anything that you want to tell me. Uh, so now with a brand new email, engagebrainpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, that's uh, the place that you can contact me with any questions or comments. Uh, so with that, I'll end the show there. Uh, thank, thank you so much, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.